Great. Yes, well, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for the great introduction, Robert, and uh, it's tremendous to be in front of you. The first one of these I did uh, was in Zurich, actually, and I remember meeting you and your colleagues, and I actually felt it was important to bring someone in from the front line of field science, how do we actually understand these things, in front of people such as you, you know, impact investments. But I must say, the first time I met you all, I felt as if I was speaking to people sort of a leap across the species. You were in charge of all the higher thinking. I felt as if my knuckles were dragging on the ground as I, um, as I walked in. Uh, but it's proven to be a good result because, you see, we really are a true force of nature. For the first time in history, there are seven billion of us and we've become a true force of nature. And yet most of us live a long way from nature. 60% of us live in urban environments. And that mass global urban migration is ramping up even faster. So we're living a long way from nature, and yet for the first time in history, we're a force of nature. We've never lived so far from it or needed it any more than we do today. So when I think of impact investing and ESG and biomimicry investing and all the great terms of natural capital and the, the great principles that, that run and, and push uh, TBLI and you all here, I think it must be worthwhile starting a conference like this with connecting with the front line. How do we really know this stuff? How do we really know about climate change? How do we really know about species? How do we know about ocean acidification? How do we know that what we're doing has some sort of practical effect on the ground? And how do we know that the information we work to comes from reliable sources? And how do we go about doing it? Well, I can tell you it's fun. It has a sense of the wild places, a sense of promise and vitality and hope that I get from the wild places. And I feel that's the way to go into a conference like this. And it's something for us to keep in mind when we look at ESG investing, is why we're really doing it. That sense of adventure, that sense of the wild places. Um, I can say it's, it's not without its risks. I came on the flight from England. I was working in Hong Kong. And I came to England just for one day, filming uh, my new BBC documentary on plastic in the oceans. And I dissected some seabirds. And it's, we all know these great stories of uh, albatrosses in the Marshall Islands and seen these horrific images of exploded young albatrosses full of lighters and bottle tops and marine debris. But it, it can feel a bit remote. I mean, these, these islands are in the middle of the Pacific. So um, related to albatrosses are fulmars, these beautiful seabirds uh, fulmars. And I did some autopsies on them on the beach in England. And of course, naturally enough, in their stomachs revealed all these great big bits of plastic for television. Well, then when I flew here, I was noticing that the lady next to me on, on, on the seat was kept, she kept sort of moving over, she kept, she was sort of sitting a bit like this. And I wasn't sure if I was in the way, I'm not a very big person, there seemed like plenty of room to me. And then when I got my tea, um, I suddenly realised that I was, even though I had had a wash, I was smelt like the inside of uh, Seabird, unfortunately. Um, so it's a risky business uh, being at the front line. Um, I was um, in Hong Kong, as I say, at one of these big plastics conferences, tremendous conference, you know, where we've got, the, the, there wasn't the, the tree huggers and the hair shirt wearing uh, environmental uh, push that you might think. It was a very smart, clever industrial conference. And it was brilliant to meet these people who have invented, uh, you know, multi-million dollar uh, uh, recycling plants where you can take multi-stream plastics. So you can take plastics from televisions and any electronics, bottles, anything you like, the whole vehicles, and out the other end of this factory comes pellets ready for uh, you know, high-speed manufacturing of basically anything. Really clever stuff, great conference. And there was a little bit in the middle where this, where this young guy stood up, Ryan, he was only 15, and he's a Hong Kong student, and his thing was he built, I don't think you can see it uh, there, it's this thing. But he'd built a kayak out of plastic bottles and rode it in the, in the coast around Hong Kong as a, as a young 15-year-old student to sort of do his bit for raising awareness about recycling of plastics. And I absolutely loved it. He gave this little five-minute talk and he was dead nervous and it was all these industry people out there. And when it came for questions, I was thinking, oh, wow, I wonder if there's going to be more technical industry questions. And it was beautiful. A lady at the back said, you know, Ryan, I'm a teacher and how do I engage our students to be more like you, to really, you know, take on an issue like this and try and make a difference. And he said the thing that I nearly jump, jumped up and gave him a hug and the kind of thing we all want him to say. He says, you know what he said? You need to get us out there more often. You need to get out to the front line. That's exactly what we want to hear from the next generation. 
Absolutely loved it. But what do I mean about the front line? Well, here's a front line that's to do with finance, it's to do with investment, it's to do with risk management, and it's a climate change story. Transarctic shipping. Um, I spend a lot of time on the transarctic circuit. All the Arctic nations have these big things called transarctic shipping conferences. And you can imagine what's happening within our lifetimes, within all of our lifetimes here, the Arctic will be completely unrecognisable. It won't be ice free, but very much like this, a lot more open water. And that'll open shipping routes. Great shipping routes will be very, very different from what we know in the past. You know, the Northwest Passage is fairly routinely travelled. The Northern Sea Route is equally fairly routinely travelled. But now there's big investment kicking in and has been for the last 20 years and will change the shape of the trade in the Northern Hemisphere, which will affect us all globally. Now, I look upon that, some people look upon that as, oh my God, the Arctic is melting. Well, it is. And it's melting partly because of some background warming, but mostly because of our activities. It's now reached the point where there's enough open water exposed that we get a big, a big feedback mechanism where instead of the, the warmth from the sun reflecting off the white ice, there's more darkness in the water, so not as much heat is reflected. So we get this sort of feedback. The same thing happens on the coastline. Instead of the coastline being white, it's now very dark. So we've got this feedback mechanism kicking in. So no matter what we do, the Arctic is going to change. So what are we doing? Well, we are, we are doing something very smart. We have come up with a sustainable, sensible, environmentally friendly, profitable adaptation to climate change that's already occurring. And it's a tremendous example to the next generation. When you think of the young ones coming through talking about climate change, and I get depressed if I see them constantly getting a negative message. We're all going to hell in a handcart because of climate change. I love it when they look at transarctic shipping and see the way that we're going about it and to see the way that the, the cooperative uh, financial groups, the consulting actuaries, the governments are all working together to make this smart. And I think it's a great, great example for us. And you know, you, know, you know we're making money at it already. I mean, the transarctic shipping is big business for consulting actuaries. The consulting actuaries are looking at publicly funded science data. So therefore, it's a good opportunity for insurance companies to reinvest in science. But they're looking at publicly funded science data, reworking and reworking and reworking it, and coming up with risk assessments and risk management for the shipping industry. This has been going on for years. And I think it's a tremendous example of the way they're doing things. And also, a lot of the insurance companies I'm working with are reinvesting very smartly. I think you know, we need to uh, get you in there, uh, Robert. So this is a great example, and everybody's in a bit of a battle for it. You can see here that China is now part of the Arctic Council. It used to be, I remember when the Arctic Council was just five or six uh, Arctic nations, but now everybody's in. Singapore, China, we're all in there. Um, but the way to get that message across, if I stand in front of a television camera and a blue screen and squawk away about transarctic shipping, people don't get it. You know, people's attention span on television is so short. So the way to do it, as Robert quite rightly says, is I regularly dive in the Arctic and that's me there diving under the North Pole. Because you can't go wrong in diving under the North Pole because people are watching. Half the audience are watching going, oh my God, I wouldn't do that. The other half are going, well, that looks fantastic. But at least they're listening to me speaking about the fact that we've got a lot less multi-year ice than we ever used to. We've got a lot of single-year ice, which means it freezes in the winter and melts in the summer. But the great huge flows of multi-year ice that we used to have through history are now mostly gone. So when I found these big, huge flows at the North Pole, I could go under and dive in the caves that are formed by those great flows, and we can get people's attention. And so how do we know, that's how we know the Arctic is warming up, but how do we know the gases and all these things that we see on television and reports about methane and CO2, how do these gases get measured and how do we know they make a difference? Well, it's because of smart scientists. I work a lot with Scripps, uh, University of California, San Diego. And the scientists there looked at the east coast of Greenland and the west coast of Greenland and thought, can we get large volumes of ancient gas? You might know at the moment that when we get ancient gas, we normally drill a hole, and in that core that we pull up, we pass through certain years. And if we go, say, the last interglacial period, 11,000 years ago, uh, the Younger Dryas period, we pick up a bit of ice like that and analyse those gases. But the trouble is, we haven't got many gases in there. It's a small bit. So how do we go about sort of open-cast mining for ancient methane and ancient CO2? Well, we go to Greenland, 
And you might imagine from this photograph that